again guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video we are taking a look at the eagerly awaited Big Radials Grum and Goose. Big Radials have now given us an aircraft that truly lives up to their name, an aircraft with not just one but two big beefy radial engines. As you can see we've got the Goose parked up just outside of our holiday lodge just on the shores of Lake Imogene. We bought the aircraft up earlier on this morning from Friedman Memorial Airport. Today's flight is going to be a full review, we're going to time travel a little back to earlier on this morning. So we'll be starting on the ground at Friedman Memorial, as usual we'll carry out a full start up. We'll fly the aircraft on a short hop up north towards Imogene Lake, we'll be landing on the lake and then we'll be bringing the aircraft back onto shore, we'll shut down, and then at the end of the video we'll take a closer look at a few more details before running through my overall conclusions on the product. As always guys I do hope you enjoy the video and find it to be of use. If you do, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. Let's now head back to earlier on this morning and we'll head for the cockpit of the Big Radials Grum and Goose. Okay, so we are now on the ground at Friedman Memorial Airport. We're in the rather beautiful cockpit of the Big Radials Grum and Goose. It's fairly early morning still, just coming up on 8 o'clock local time. We've just carried out our aircraft checks, the Goose is secure and ready to go. So running through the startup checklist, the parking brake is set. Battery switches and generator switches can go on. Carburetor air is set to cold. Prop we can set to full decrease. Fuel tank selector can go on to both. And the fuel cutoff valves are both on. Cross feed is off. And on the wobble pump we're just going to prime that once. We're just looking for a fuel pressure there of between 3 and 4 psi. Emergency ignition switch is on. Mixtures are set to idle cutoff. We'll prime the engine. To do that, we'll just pump the throttle four times. And we can crack the throttle for the start. Max can go on to both. We'll be starting the left hand engine first. And we can engage the starter. Okay, so we do have a good start there on the left engine. We'll run through the same startup process on the right. Mixture, we'll leave that in the auto rich position just because that's easy with my hardware. We prime the engine, the throttle is cracked. Magnetos can go to both. I'm going to gauge the starter. You can see that the engines do take a pretty realistic amount of time to uh, fire up, which is really nice to see. I gather radial engines are pretty tricky beasts to get going at the best of times. Anyway, a good start there on the right engine as well, just letting the RPMs come up. And once again the oil pressure is checked, that's up in the green band. For the engine warm-up we want to leave the engines idling around 800 to 1000 RPM. Making sure that there's no drop in oil pressure. And we're all good there, we're waiting for at least 30 degrees on the oil temperature, we're already up through 70. So the engines are nice and warm. In terms of the taxi, we'll come fully back on the stick. Part brake can come off. We're going to be departing out to the north, which is actually straight off the nose, but we'll take the southerly runway as the threshold for that's just behind us, and that's going to save us a lot of uh, time backtracking the runway. There's no wind around, so we'll just have to make a turn back out towards the north once we depart. Overall I definitely like the uh, ground handling of the Goose at uh, taxi speeds, it feels pretty decent in terms of rudder input, the brakes feel good as well, they're not overly responsive. Now we'll just carry out the run up in our present position, there's nothing behind us, so gently coming onto the brakes. And once again the part brake can go on. Again just leaving the engines idling around 800 RPM. For the run up, the part brake is set, we'll come fully back on the yoke. Prop control can go to full increase.
mixture is set to auto rich manifold pressure according to the checklist we want to come up to 30 inches on the manifold pressure which seems rather high to me and I have tried that it's not really possible to carry out a mag check at 30 inches so we're just going to go for 2000 rpm that's a fairly typical figure so we'll go with 30 inches initially we'll carry out the checks in the checklist there's no mention of any mag check or prop check so we'll come back to 2000 rpm thereafter to carry those out So there's our 30 inches, we're looking for a maximum cylinder head temperature of 205 degrees. We're currently through about 150, so we're all good there. Oil pressure is checked. Oil temperature, we're looking for between 60 and 102 degrees. Just within limits there at the moment, but the oil temperature is still coming up quite rapidly. Fuel pressure is checked. As I say, we'll come back to 2000 RPM to carry out our mag check. There does seem to be a slight dead zone there in the throttle movement. So again, just adjusting our throttles for 2000 RPM. And there's 2000, so we'll carry out a mag check. Firstly on the left engine. Showing a slight drop there on the left. And back to both. And same on the right, we'll go back to both. Those RPMs just creeping up there. The RPM does respond fairly slowly to uh, throttle inputs. Just waiting for that RPM on the right engine to stabilise. Interestingly, a slight disparity there between the two engines. Anyway, we'll carry on mag check on the right. Pretty significant drop there on the right. Go back to both. And onto the left. Yeah, so we're getting about a 100 RPM drop overall. And back to both. Again, we'll just wait for the prop to come back up to 2000 RPM. And we'll cycle the prop lever. You can see the props do respond pretty slowly there. It's not entirely surprising. I imagine an aircraft of this vintage, the, uh, the governors might be obviously fairly old technology. It might be true to life that they respond quite slowly. Lastly, we'll just try the carp heat. And we are showing a drop there in RPM as well with the carp heat. Once again, checking our temperatures and pressures. The oil temperatures now have come through the uh, green band there, and that does seem to be the case as well in the cruise with the aircraft. And her temperatures are up at uh, 250 degrees, and we were looking for a maximum of 205, so we're getting pretty toasty. And anyway, we'll come back to idle. Going through our takeoff checks, the fuel cross feed is off. Tail wheel, we'll lock that once we're on the runway. Carburetor heat is set cold. Elevator trim is set to neutral. Rudder trim is set. Mixtures are in the auto rich position. We're idling there on the engines, around 600 RPM. Don't really want to go any lower than that at the moment. The engines are sounding a little bit like they're going to start coughing. Anyway, the mixture is set to auto rich. Parking brake can come off. And we've got ourselves into position here on runway 13. So all clear on final. The aircraft's fairly straightforward to taxi for a tailwheel aircraft with quite a low nose attitude. Anyway, we'll just get ourselves lined up here on the runway centre line. Again, gently onto the brakes.
Okay, so we are all set. We'll lock the tailwheel. It's a little bit dark here in the moment in the cockpit as well, so we'll just get the instrument lighting on. And the landing lights and the PTA heat can go on. Part brake can come off. We're looking for 35.5 inches on the manifold pressure. That's our takeoff power setting, so coming up on the throttles. Of course, initially no rudder authority with the tailwheel lock, so just using a little bit of braking to keep the aircraft straight. And power is set. Now that we've got some airspeed, the rudder is more responsive. The rudder feels a little bit wallowy. It does seem to induce quite a bit of roll as well. Anyway, coming back on the yoke. The aircraft reasonably heavy in pitch, needing quite a lot of backstick here. We can tap the brakes, the gear can come up. And we'll put in a uh, boot full of elevator trim here just to ease off on the control forces. Anyway, our takeoff power setting we can maintain for a maximum of 5 minutes, but we're not going to need it for anything like that long. Aircraft definitely feeling a little bit left wing heavy as well at the moment, so we'll just trim that out with some rudder trim. We'll talk more about that in a moment's time. We'll come back to our climb power setting now, so looking for 32 inches on the manifold pressure. And 2200 RPM. And you can definitely feel the aircraft pulling less there as well as we come back on the engines. Those uh, junior wasps definitely do have a little bit of pull to them, which is really nice to see. Anyway, we're just making a right turn to head back out towards the north just to keep away from the high terrain that's out on our left. As you can see, though, still going to be coming in over the mountains. Yeah, so the Goose feels a little bit wallowy on the takeoff. It does have a fairly narrow undercarriage as well, which would make it a little bit less stable. But as I said, the rudder input did seem to induce quite a bit of roll there. The takeoff, I would say, felt okay. But I have to say, once you've got the aircraft airborne, it actually flies really nicely. It's got a real feeling of weight to it. It does feel like a big old lumbering beast. It's pretty stable and you do need some pretty significant control inputs to actually get the aircraft to move around. But I imagine that's exactly as the goose should be. Anyway, we've got the airfield just coming up off on our right. And it's going to be a nice easy VFR run for us today. We're basically just going to be following a road all the way out towards the destination. The road just coming up on our nose now. So running through our climb checks, the power is set, prop controls are set. Cylinder head temperature, we're looking for a maximum of 260 degrees. We're showing about uh, 240 there, so we're good now on the cylinder temps. Carb heat is set cold. 
landing gear. Nice little feature on the uh, goose. You can actually visually check that the landing gear is up through the uh, portal there. And the landing gear is up. The flaps are up. It was a flaps up takeoff. No mention of any uh, flap setting in the uh, checklist itself. I did see that it does recommend uh, flap for a short field takeoff. So we'll climb up to an altitude of 10,000 feet. Again, needing some significant control inputs there to pitch the nose down. Quite a bit of trim as well to reduce the control forces. And we'll come back on the power levers now. We'll go for 30 inches manifold pressure. And 2000 on the RPM. So power is set. Still needing quite a bit of trim here to get the aircraft levelled off. Just coming over the uh, town of Haley, which of course the airfield lends part of its name to. I think we slightly overdid it there on the rudder trim, so just correcting for that. So almost approaching 10,000 feet, we'll get the aircraft levelled off. The Goose definitely needs quite a bit of trim initially to uh, get itself stable, but once you've got it there, it really just sits there. Actually quite a nice aircraft to hand fly in that respect, it doesn't take too much input. And again, once you've got it up and cruising, it's a really nice aircraft to fly in the sim. It certainly feels the part, it feels heavy. It does feel like it's got a lot of inertia to it as well. Again, exactly as I imagine the goose would be to fly. Anyway, we're just going to continue to track northwest here for the time being. As I said, just following the road, which you can see just down below us on the left. We follow that pretty much all the way in towards the destination, though we do have a few waypoints en route. Okay, so we're just coming up at being the town of Ketchum, which again is waypoint one. We'll just get the aircraft again turned to uh, follow the road out towards the northwest. Then we're going to uh, run through a little bit on the gyro pilot. I will just state before we try the gyro pilot, to me it seems there's a few issues with it at the moment. As always, that could be user error, but I have run through the manual and I'm somewhat familiar with how these systems generally work. My understanding is basically we have an attitude and a uh, heading index and we need to set those to align with our current attitude and heading and then the aircraft should track that. As it stands at the moment we can adjust the uh, pitch index there on the gyro pilot. So we'll line that up with our current pitch. I can't find a uh, click spot though to adjust the heading index. The top line of the gyro compass here is our current heading and the bottom line is the index so ideally we need to line the two up to have the aircraft fly heading but as you can see, there doesn't seem to be a click spot for that. So we have both the uh, gyro compass and the gyro attitude indicator there. We also have a suction gauge just to make sure there is sufficient uh, suction going to the gyro instruments. Below that we have various uh, servo indications for both the rudder, the aileron and the elevator. And then above that we have controls to actually physically adjust both the rudder, the ailerons and the elevator. So as it stands currently, I don't think we can actually set the gyro pilot to track a heading. But you'll notice we've got the uh, pitch index there lined up with our current attitude. We'll turn the gyro pilot on. And the aircraft actually wants to go into a descent there. Again, that could be user error, but my understanding is it should pretty much maintain our present attitude with the index aligned. Even if we adjust that up, it doesn't look like we're going to go into a climb. 
In short, I think some of the gyro pilot functionality is missing at the moment. Nonetheless, you do still have basic autopilot functionality as we can leave the aircraft with the gyro pilot in and then we can just fly the aircraft using the elevator, aileron and rudder adjustments. So for example here we use the elevator control there just to put us back up to 10,000 feet. So the adjustments you can make are fairly crude and as a result the uh, ability to fly the aircraft is somewhat limited but there is enough there that certainly you can fly the aircraft more or less hands off and certainly reduces the workload quite a bit in the cruise if you are doing some longer sectors. But otherwise though I have to say the Goose is great fun to fly and it's uh, really perfect for the sim. Another of those aircraft that's really good for exploring. It's got a lot of character as well, a lot of attitude to it. And that's often very hard to create with add-ons obviously. Uh, some add-ons have more success than others but it sounds pretty good to me. It flies very nicely, it looks the part. And again it's just great fun for exploring these sorts of regions. Hopping in and out of lakes and unprepared airstrips. In that respect it gets a big thumbs up from me. I'm really enjoying the flight and I can definitely see the potential for a lot more fun in the sim with it in the future. As I mentioned during the introduction we're going to be heading out towards Imaging Lake, we're going to be landing on the lake, we'll try and obviously get a water landing out of the Goose, that's pretty much a must for reviewing any amphibious aircraft. So we'll carry out a landing on the lake and then we'll get ourselves back up onto uh, dry land and as I say we'll finish up the uh, video with just as usual a few other points about the aircraft. So tracking out to the north once again, we are going to have to cut over these hills, 10,000 feet should just about keep us clear, we may have to climb a little bit higher but we'll pick our way through the terrain as we go. Visually at the moment it looks as though 10,000 feet is going to do the job. And once we've made our way out towards Imogene Lake we'll overfly the lake, we'll do a quick orbit around, make sure that the landing area is nice and clear for us. We'll try and get a feel for what the wind's doing. There should be a windsock up at the uh, strip itself. And then we'll come back in for our water landing. It's going to be pretty interesting to see how the aircraft behaves there. The water physics in the sim currently certainly nothing to write home about. A little bit trickier to see the road now. It's a little bit more hidden away down in the valley and some tree coverage but you can still make it out quite clearly just down below us and leading out towards the north and then it actually climbs the side of the uh, mountain there off to our 11 o'clock. We are just gaining a little bit of altitude currently but that's fine again that's only going to help us clear the uh, tops of these hills so we'll just leave our trim setting for the time being. Again though really enjoying the goose and there are a lot of nice little touches and attentions to detail which We'll cover again towards the end of the video. As I said I just think the aircraft has uh, bags of character. So we did manage to clear the hills quite nicely there, we're up at 10,400 feet now. Smiley Creek just off to our 10 o'clock. We're not going to fly directly overhead the field, we're going to be visual with the road. We've also got a river as well now leading out towards destination, so again navigation is going to be pretty straightforward. Really just making quite a leisurely meandering trip through the mountains today. Up towards our little uh, holiday lodge.
We don't really want to climb any higher now though, so we will just give a, a couple of notches there on the elevator trim. Just to try and get the aircraft levelled out. We'll maintain our altitude though. Again, we're going to be overflying the lake before we land. So we'll have a little bit of time to lose some altitude in the orbit and then as well on the approach. Just keeping an eye out for the airstrip for the sake of interest. I think I've got it spotted now. It parallels the uh, river and I think it's just off to our 10 o'clock. If you follow the road in just down below us, out towards the river, just out to the right of that's the airstrip. It's a grass strip, it's actually quite a substantial length I would say. Got a couple of farming circles as well just coming off the nose. And again off on our left at our 10 o'clock we've got Alturas Lake. And if we follow the river out to the north you can see there's two smaller lakes off the nose. Our lake's going to be pretty much equidistant between those two but a little bit further out to the west. So rapidly approaching destination now. As things are going to get fairly busy in the descent we'll start running through our approach checks. So the mixtures are in auto rich, prop control will leave for the time being. Fuel tank selector, we are on both in terms of fuel quantity. Not sure if that's US gallons, I would assume probably it is, We're showing about 53 there on the right. And about uh, 42 there on the left. That's quite interesting. So we do have the fuel tank selector set to both. It looks as though at the moment though we're only burning off the left tank. So we'll try switching over to the right. See how we go there. So fuel tank selector is on the fullest tank. For the approach speed we're looking for 80 knots down the approach. 70 on short final touching down at 60. It's going to be gear up, very important to remember that for the water landing, so we'll just visually confirm that now. Again we do have the gear up. And we'll be taking the flaps as required on the way down. Brakes are off. Instruments are checked, landing light can come on. And harness is secure. So just leaving Smiley Creek behind us. And again we've got uh, Alturas Lake just passing below the float. And we'll just continue to track north until we're equidistant between the two lakes here and then we'll be turning out towards the west. That should put us bang on course for uh, Imogene Lake. So you can see the strip just down below us. Can't really make out the windsock but don't really want to be getting any lower than this. Again the wind should be fairly light so we'll just plan to uh, land with the option that gives us the longest landing distance available. Okay so you can just see the windsock there now it's moving around quite a bit looks like the wind is more or less straight down the lake. Looks pretty much 50-50 in terms of landing options. I think we'll come back in from the direction we just approached. Ideally we want to have ourselves stop there before we start approaching the island. It looks like there's quite a lot of obstacles there in the centre of the lake in terms of rocks and trees and various other features. So I think what we'll aim to do, we'll touch down right in the corner of the lake and we'll take a diagonal across, pretty much paralleling the uh, the runway itself there. So we'll just continue this left turn back round for a little bit of a left hand downwinds. 
down at 9,500 feet now. That's fine. We want to keep losing some altitude here. We're going to cut across the back of the side of these hills and then we'll descend back down through the valley. So again, 80 knots initially on the approach, 70 down towards short final and then back at 60 knots for touchdown. Definitely going to be using full flap. Visibility in the aircraft is pretty good overall, certainly out towards the front and out to the side. So it's a little bit more limited out, out in the direction of the wings, obviously with the floats and the radial engines there as well. does make manoeuvring like this a little bit trickier. Anyway, we'll start coming back on the throttles. We can start our descent now as we come back down the valley. The reflection there on the glass is a little bit unattractive and it does rather block the view, although I will say I prefer having any reflection to none at all. It does add a little bit to the immersion. And you certainly miss the lack of reflections now if they're not included on an aircraft. So the lake should be buried somewhere away under the uh, left-hand engine. And sure enough, there it is. So we're going to hug the side of the hills out on our right to come in for that diagonal landing. get the speed back to around 80 knots. And we'll take a stage of flap. So 30 degrees there on the flaps. 60 degrees is the landing flap setting, so a lot of drag. We're not going to take that until we're absolutely sure we're going to make the uh, lake. pitch can go back to full fine. Once again visually confirming the undercarriage is up. Again we'll just hold the flaps. Landing clearance obviously not required and the landing area is clear. So we're just a touch high and fast now we'll take landing flap. see that adds a load of drag, the speed really dropping off there, so coming right back up on the throttles. Now we're just going to clip our way over the tops of the trees. We want the speed back at 60 knots as we touch down. So back off the throttles. Coming back on the yoke, again the aircraft pretty heavy on the controls, certainly takes a while to respond. Holding her off. There's touchdown. Pretty gentle there in terms of the water interaction. Starting to get that characteristic Microsoft Flight Simulator bump there now, but not bad overall. So we'll just use some rudder to get ourselves turned out to the right. Okay, so we just got ourselves turned around, we're making our way back in towards the strip. I have to say the goose is a real handful on the water, there's no water rudder so it is just a case of using differential power settings to steer the aircraft really. The rudder does help a little bit if you pick up some speed and if you really need to tighten up the turn you can try using a bit of aileron as well just to help dig in the float and really get you turned around. Anyway, I said we carry out a bit of a party trick here so we're actually going to lower the landing gear. I have no idea whether or not the Goose is certified for such an operation in reality, but we're going to drive ourselves up onto the land. Got our tail wheel unlocked, we'll just go full power here to help us get up the hill.
So again, it really is a go anywhere, do anything kind of aircraft. And we're just going to backtrack the runway. We'll make our way in towards the lodge, which is just the other side of these trees. And get the flaps up. And the Lang Light repeater heat can go off. Again, lovely puttering sounds there from those big old radials. And the aircraft just bogging down a little bit here in the turn, so having to really come up on the power. And you can see our lodge just off the nose. So off the power, gently onto the brakes. And the part brake can go on. Once again we'll come up on the throttles, let the engines idle around 800 RPM. The engines really are quite slow to respond. Again, I suspect that's probably true to life, more or less. So running through the shutdown checks, the part brake is set. Prop can go to full decrease. Throttles are back at 800 RPM, cylinder head temperatures we're looking for below 140. We're still up around 200 there at the moment, but we're not going to wait for the engines to cool down or we'll be sitting here all day. Fuel crossfeed valve is set to close, and on that note we'll just check those fuel gauges there. Still showing 50 there on the right, but we are burning from the uh, right there currently. To be fair though, we're mostly idle power there for the approach. Anyway, the mixtures can come back to idle cutoff. We'll just do both at the same time, it's a little bit easier on my hardware. So that's our flight complete. Hopefully you've had a good opportunity throughout the flight to see a fairly decent amount of the big radials Grum and Goose. Nonetheless, as usual, we'll try and look at some of the finer details a little bit more closely. We've now got the aircraft back on the ground. We've got the rear entrance hatch opened. The boarding ladder is installed. And as you can see as well, we've fitted the hubcaps there to the wheels. Again, we'll talk about those features a little bit more in just a moment's time. Overall, I think that Big Radials have done a really nice job with the Grum and Goose. The aircraft looks beautiful. It's obviously quite a beautiful airframe inherently. In terms of the modelling and texturing, I wouldn't say that it's right up there with the very best, but it's certainly a very competent effort overall. There are a few areas of the aircraft where the edges could just be a little bit more rounded off, although to be fair, you do have to get pretty close in to notice any such details. The same goes with the texturing. Overall, very nice. I do particularly enjoy the detailing in terms of the weathering there on the underside of the airframe. The riveting and the PBR of the aircraft also done very nicely. And throughout the attention to detail is good, you can see that the undercarriage has been modelled rather well. We saw for example as well the details in terms of the functional porthole through which to see the undercarriage extension and retraction. That's a really nice touch and it's touches like that that really make the big radials Grum and Goose feel like an aircraft that's had a lot of love, care and attention go into it. Similarly again you can see nice weathering there on the underside of the fuselage, nice dirt marks there around the tyre. And lastly, of course, with an aircraft made by big radials, you'd certainly be hoping that the detailing on the radial engines is up to standards. And I would say overall it certainly is a very nice visual model there of the Junior Wasp engines. I will say in terms of the prop discs, at some points throughout the flight they looked really good. There were certain other times though where they looked a little bit off. Overall I would say that the animations are a positive of the aircraft, but there are areas that could be improved by big radials. Certainly for me though, I really like the overall rendition of the aircraft. I think the modelling and the texturing really goes to evoke the beauty of the Grumman Goose. And again, I think it's a really solid effort from the Big Red Jaws team. Internally, I think you've already had a pretty good chance there to see the cockpit, so we're just going to run through the various features of the cabin that we've yet to look at. Firstly, we do have a forward hatch just below the main panel. 
that is operable. You can open the door. A really nice feature there. You can actually not only open the door, but as you'll see, that leads into a forward cargo compartment. And that also has access to an upper entrance hatch to the aircraft. So again, really nice detailing there. Although I would note on the texturing, you can see there is some banding. Another really nice feature of the Grumman Goose. Big radials do seem to be fans of hiding away features in rather well disguised areas. And certainly the Grumman Goose is no exception. In this instance, we have a floor panel between the two pilot seats. We can open that up. And we can bring up a panel with various options. Firstly, we do have a working transponder and Genus 530. So if you want to use the aircraft on VATSIM, you're well catered for there. We have various aircraft options that we can turn on or off via the toggle switches. We can add or remove the yokes. We can also add or remove a leather banding around the yokes. We can also add or remove a boarding ladder, which you'll have seen just a moment ago. There's also a small fishing stool. We also have a water help option, which is really great. As I mentioned, the Grumman Goose, by its very nature, is a little bit of a dog to handle on the water. The water helper option obviously makes the aircraft more controllable if you're trying to taxi around on a lake or out at sea. We didn't use that for the flight today, but I do think it's a really good option. And to be honest, I'd probably use that myself for any other flight. Microsoft Flight Simulator's water physics are still a bit hit and miss. It can be particularly hard trying to manoeuvre an aircraft, particularly if there's a strong crosswind. Lastly, we have the option to attach wheel hubs, which again you'll have just seen outside. And we have the option to attach a water anchor which we'll take a look at later on. It is worth noting with the water anchor, unfortunately it's not going to keep the aircraft physically in place. I assume that's just a limitation of the sim. Anyway, coming around to the rear of the cockpit, again you can see overall the detailing is very nice. We've got the fire extinguisher there. Again we have the undercarriage porthole. And we now have the cockpit entrance hatch which again can be opened. That leads us into the cabin which has been modelled just as nicely as the cockpit I would say overall. The texturing and the modelling very much up to the same sorts of standards. And finally coming down to the rear of the cabin we have the aircraft's main entrance hatch which is also operable. Again we can also choose to add or remove the boarding ladder. And we have a rear storage hatch, again operable. And if we head into the rear compartment we have a nice couple of details there. A few crates stored down the back and of course the most important facility on the aircraft. Anyway that just about wraps up our closer look at the modelling and the texturing. We're going to carry out one quick stall before we wrap up the review, so we'll head back up into the air and to the cockpit of the Grumman Goose. Okay, so we are airborne once again in the Grumman Goose, coming straight back off the throttles. We've got significant altitude here to carry out the stall. And coming back on the stick, you can see there the manifold pressures and the RPMs coming back. Just keeping the aircraft more or less straight and level for the time being. And keep it good on our airspeed, just coming back through 90 knots. There's 80, the aircraft is getting quite heavy now on the controls. And back through 70, having to come further back on the stick. You can see we're still in a very shallow descent here, back through 60 knots. A little bit of buffeting there, the left wing dropping, that's a power off stall of course. The aircraft snapping left wing down. Rather tentatively entering into a spin there, we're keeping full back stick. But we'll recover from this position. And pitching the nose up once again. I have tried a couple more stalls in the aircraft, it does seem to roll and spin slightly more organically out to the right with power on. Overall I would say that the stall characteristics, they're not the best that I've seen in the sim, but they're fairly competent overall and actually I have to say the aircraft does rather bite you if you get low speed. So there you go guys, I hope you enjoyed our outing in the Big Radials Grum and Goose. I know that I certainly did. Overall I think the aircraft really lived up to expectations. Again, I think it has bags of character, it really feels the part. And for that reason alone, I think it's a really enjoyable add-on. Nonetheless, it does have its good points, it does have its bad, so we'll try and break those down just to finish up the review. Firstly, running through the negatives, most of my points there are pretty minor in nature. Firstly, it would be quite nice to have the option to remove the pilots. Really, just for screenshots like this, it would have looked a little bit more authentic if I'd been able to do that. I did try removing the pilots via the weight and balance menu, but that didn't seem to have any effect. Perhaps an option there on the hidden away little clipboard that we saw in the cockpit would have been a nice addition. Secondly, touching on the gyro pilot, I did actually reach out to Big Radials after the flight. Currently, there are some functions that are inoperative, although they are going to be looking to fix those up in the near future. So a negative for now, but I suspect given Big Radial's previous history in the sim, they'll be pretty quick to patch that up. They've been very proactive so far with their other add-ons. Lastly, in terms of negatives, I would say that the prop animations, as I said, at times they look really great, but there are certain other times where they look a little bit more clunky. 
I think those could just use a little bit more refinement. And similarly, I don't know how accurate it is to the real world aircraft, but the props were very slow to respond at certain points. That may be true to life, but at a guess I would say it's perhaps just a touch on the slow side. In terms of the flight model, that definitely gets a positive from me overall, but just touching on the negative aspects. As I said during the takeoff, the aircraft felt a little bit wallowy to me. Again, the Goose does have quite a narrow undercarriage, it's not really necessarily designed to be taking off on land on a regular basis. But I did notice that the rudder was quite slow to respond, even with large inputs, and again it did induce quite a lot of roll, so the takeoff can feel rather wallowy, it can get a little bit squirrely. In terms of the aircraft's handling during the approach, overall that felt good, although it was pretty hard to keep 60 knots there with full flat, we needed almost full power, so perhaps just a little bit too much drag. Again though, that's pure conjecture on my part, never having flown the goose, and it may well be true to life. In terms of my positives, lots of good things to say about the aircraft. Firstly, again I think that Big Radials have done a really nice job of capturing the character of the goose. The aircraft feels heavy, it feels cumbersome, there's quite a lot of inertia and weight on the controls. To my ear, those radial engines sounded pretty nice throughout most of the range there. Certainly rather nice when back at idle and puttering away. Cockpit sounds overall were good, pretty immersive. Most of the switches seemed to have sounds, and most of the systems seemed to have associated sounds as well. In terms of the aircraft systems, overall reasonably comprehensive. Certainly not study level, but nonetheless the engines felt like they were a little bit of a handful to manage at times. Not so much in terms of actually operating them, but certainly in terms of getting them started. They don't necessarily start easily. And pretty much every cockpit control seemed to be operable, so again there's more than enough there to simulate the Grumman Goose experience. Modelling overall very good, again there were a few areas that in theory could be refined, but they're certainly up to standards. And the same goes with the texturing, I really like the look and the feel of the aircraft overall, externally the textures are very good. Internally they do look perhaps a touch more dated, but again they feel the part overall. In terms of liveries, the selection is somewhat limited, but I'm sure there'll be plenty of third party repaints for the aircraft going forward. And the liveries that we do have, they're nice, they feel quite appropriate for the aircraft. The aircraft's manual is also fairly thorough. Most details that I was looking for there were covered. It does have both the system's depth, as well as details on how to fly the aircraft. And another really nice touch that big radials tend to include with their products. The Goose does also come with a bush trip, which if memory serves me correctly, focuses on flying around Canada. I haven't tried it myself yet, but again it goes to show that big radials have really put a lot of extra love, care and attention into the product that they didn't necessarily have to do. The FPS is also another big bonus for the aircraft. I was actually getting around 6 FPS more than the default Cessna 152. So the Goose is a very FPS friendly aircraft and it certainly felt like it during the flight. I didn't notice any stuttering there. So overall, whilst I do feel there are some areas that can be improved, I think that the Big Radials Grumman Goose is a really nice offering for the sim. As I mentioned during the flight, I think the Grumman Goose is perfect for Microsoft Flight Simulator. It really lets you explore almost any region of the planet, any type of geography and geology. It's not necessarily going to get you quickly from A to B, but I think you'll have really good fun as you make the journey. And lastly, the product's retailing at 35 Australian dollars, so around £20. I think it's very commendable that Big Radials have chosen this price point. It's not your average Microsoft Flight Simulator price point, slightly below. And I think overall at that sort of price, the aircraft offers really good value for money, well worth taking a look at. Again, for me, I really enjoyed our flight out in the aircraft. I think it's one of the perfect aircraft for adventuring in the sim. And I'm sure we'll probably have one or two more adventures with it going forwards. Anyway guys, once again, I do hope you enjoyed the video and found it to be of use. If you did, please consider giving the video a like. If you want to see more content from the channel, then please consider subscribing as well. As ever, a very big thank you to my channel members and patrons for all of your support. And lastly, a thank you to Big Radials who were kind enough to let us take a look at the aircraft today. Anyway guys, I hope all of you are having a great day wherever you are, take really good care and I will see you all again soon.